Well, hello and welcome to another lesson from God's Word. I'm glad that you could join me. You know, every now and then you run across stories of, of kids, little children, who express their confusion over certain things that they see and hear in church during a worship service. A lot of times they get the words of the hymns all confused. You know, like the one kid that thought, uh, instead of up from the grave, he arose. He thought it was up from the grave, he arose. <laughs> Another little kid, they, they asked him what his favorite song was. He said, I love singing about the bear. And the mom said, the bear? He said, yeah, gladly, the cross-eyed bear. <laughs> so they get it all confused, right? And that's little kids. And that's especially true when it comes to the Lord's Supper, right? They don't understand, you know, as the adults are passing these plates by and they're taking these little crackers and they're taking the little cups of juice and yet the, the children don't understand, well, why can't I have that? Because they look at it as a snack. They have no understanding many times of the real meaning. It's like the little boy who was given a quarter one Sunday while he was visiting his grandparents and they took him to church and he wasn't used to being in church. And so they took him, gave him his quarter, and then uh, as the Lord's Supper was passed, the bread and, and cup passed down the pew, his grandparents said that he couldn't have any. And he didn't like that. They said he wasn't old enough. And so he kind of folded his arms and just was kind of upset about that. And then a minute later, the offering plate came by, and so the grandparents said, okay, put your quarter in. And he hollered as loud, so loud, everybody in the auditorium could hear him. He said, if I can't eat, I ain't going to pay. I mean, he was upset because he didn't understand anything about the supper and what it was about. And But here's the thing, brethren. You know, I think that we all need to be reminded at times what the Lord's Supper is all about. Would you agree with me? And as we're continuing this theme that we've had for the last several lessons on remembering, uh, we want to look at the Lord's Supper because Jesus said, you remember, do this in remembrance of me because we don't ever want the communion the lord's supper to just become commonplace something that's just an empty ritual that we just you know get through and and move on and so uh, uh let's let's take some time this morning and and look at the meaning and purpose behind the lord's supper and you know i'm not going to spend all of our time in the lesson today discussing the reasons for observing the lord's supper every week every first day of the week, every Sunday. But I need to mention it because critics of the churches of Christ say that we're overdoing it by weekly, uh, the weekly observance. You're overdoing it, they say. They say it makes it commonplace. It takes away from its special meaning when you participate in the supper every week. And so uh, that's why a lot of religious groups out there they observe the supper once a month or once a quarter or some even just once a year. And so, so they say, well, see, that way it's always special to us. But there's just a couple of things wrong with that line of reasoning. First of all, if that's true of the Lord's Supper, then why isn't it true of the other aspects of worship, right? For example, we pray every Sunday. We pray every week in worship. And so does that somehow take away from the meaning and purpose of prayer? Does that somehow make prayer commonplace? Do you think that if we just prayed once a month or once a quarter or just once a year, do you think that would make prayer more meaningful to us? You see, if you're going to be consistent in your argument, you've got to say that what you're saying about the Lord's Supper is true with the other aspects of worship as well. I mean, how can you single out communion as the only act of worship affected by what you call overdoing it? Let me ask you this, a simple question. Do you think it's possible to remember Jesus too much? You think that's a problem? You think the Lord would ever say, you know, Jerry, you're remembering me just a little too much there. <laughs> no. After all, that's what we do in the Lord's Supper, isn't it? When he instituted the supper, Jesus told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. And so do you think it's possible to remember Jesus too much? Of course not. But now let me ask you this. Is it possible for us to fail to remember Jesus enough? Absolutely. See, there's the real problem. 
And so, folks, the argument that observing the Lord's Supper every Sunday takes away from its meaning, it's just not true. It's not true. If it was, the same thing would be true for reading and studying the Bible every Sunday and praying every Sunday and singing every Sunday. And something else that's always intrigued me about folks that argue that observing the Lord's Supper every Sunday is just too much. It's overdoing it. These same folks, these same critics, never let a Sunday go by without passing around uh, an offering plate at least once. Sometimes several times in a, in a service. And I don't mean that to be facetious, or, and I don't mean that in a, in a mean-spirited way at all. But uh, what confuses me is the fact that the same basic wording that's used in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 in reference to the weekly collection, that same wording is used in Acts 20 and verse 7 concerning the weekly observance of the supper. And in one place they get it, and the other place they don't. In one place they accept it, and the other place they reject it. And that doesn't make any sense. Let me show you what I mean. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Either find it or just listen. I'm going to read it to you anyway. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Paul tells the church at Corinth, Now concerning the collection of the saints, the offering, as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must also do, on the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. And so the collection was to be taken up when? On the first day of the week. Now notice what the Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts 20 and verse 7. Here the Bible tells us that the first century church, the first Christians, they came together on Sunday, on the first day of the week, to break bread. That is, to partake of the Lord's Supper. Here's what the verse says. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. And so, when did they meet? Well, it says they met on the first day of the week. And what did they do when they met on the first day of the week? Well, besides singing and praying and teaching, we know they did that from other verses that talks about their worship. They took up a collection, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and they broke bread. Acts 20 and verse 7. Now let me ask you a silly question. The verses say that they met together on the first day of the week to do these things. How many weeks has a first day? Every week has a first day. And so every Lord's Day, every first day of the week, they met together, and when they did, among other things, they observed the Lord's Supper. It's just not hard to it, it's, it's, it's not hard to understand, is it? Um, in fact, many of the early denominational leaders understood this truth. John Calvin, who founded the Presbyterian Church, wrote this, Every week the table of the Lord should be spread for Christian assemblies. John Calvin even understood that. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, he wrote this, I also advise the elders to administer the supper of the Lord every first day of the week. But brethren, just getting the timing right doesn't mean that we understand and appreciate the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. See, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the details that we miss the main point. See, the communion, the Lord's Supper, is not an issue to debate over. But sometimes that's the way we've treated it. And how sad it is. So let's don't waste our time fussing over things like whether you're going to have one cup or many cups or fermented or unfermented wine. Instead, let's focus on the meaning behind the supper. And so very quickly, let's take a look at what the Lord's Supper really is. Number one, it is a commemoration. In other words, it's a memorial. That's what the word commemoration means. And look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so it's a commemoration. It's a memorial. Jesus said twice there, do this in remembrance of me. And as we talked about in the past several lessons, you know, mankind has always had a tendency to forget. It's embarrassing to forget things that you're supposed to remember, like someone's name or an important date. Uh, my dad, many of you remember my dad, Percy Keene. My dad actually forgot a gospel meeting that he was supposed to preach. And uh, I've never done that, and Lord willing, I never will. But I remember him talking about how embarrassed he was. He was in Bible class one Sunday morning teaching, teaching class down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And the phone in the church rang, and, and uh, it was an elder in the church, uh, a church up in Arkansas. And he said, Brother King, where are you? Our meeting starts today and everybody's here waiting on you. <laughs> so, you know, I've forgotten a lot of things, but so far I hadn't forgotten anything like that. But we have a real problem, don't we, in forgetting important things. Not only are important dates and names forgotten, but sometimes even the best of people are forgotten. Like uh, Joseph, when he was forgotten in that prison. You know, he interpreted the dream of the king's butler, but Genesis 4, 40 and verse 23 says, Yet the chief butler, when he was released, he did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. The children of Israel kept getting into trouble because they kept forgetting the Lord who brought them out of slavery. So we need reminders. That's why we have memorials, so we can be reminded of people and events that should never be forgotten. Uh, we, we build monuments like uh, the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial or the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to remind us of people and events that should never be forgotten. And yet in spite of this, still many forget. And the saddest fact of all is even God is forgotten by many. And so God uses memorials to help us remember. To Noah, God put a rainbow in the cloud so Noah wouldn't forget him. To the Jews, he instituted the Passover feast so the children of Israel would not forget that God spared them in Egypt. And now in the church, God has given us the supper and it's a memorial, it's a commemoration to the great price that was paid for our salvation, the body and blood of Jesus. And you know, the elements of the Lord's Supper uh, are rich with meaning. We see the bread broken. And we hear passages of scripture read about nails tearing through flesh or thorns ripping into the scalp or a spear plunging into the side. And then we see the glistening red of the wine and the cup and we see the Son of God hanging on that cross, bleeding his life away to pay for our sins. And so the Lord's Supper points us back to Calvary. It reminds us that God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. <clears throat> and so, as we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, understand it's a commemoration. It's a reminder of Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. And then number two, the Lord's Supper is a communion. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, the Bible says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So it's a communion. You know, folks, we're all different, right? We're different. And there's obvious differences between us in age, in education, in race. There's political differences. There's economic differences. There's differences in personalities and opinions. And these differences have divided people in the past and they'll con continue to divide people in the future. And sadly, these differences have divided a lot of churches as well. And it's been an excuse for Christians to treat each other in very unchristian ways. 
ways. How sad that is. And, and you know, some of these differences may really bug you, right? Something I do may really get under your skin and vice versa. But folks, listen to me. That person sitting next to you or across the aisle from you in that church auditorium, that person is your brother or sister in Christ. That's your brother and sister in the family of God. And you're called on to love them as Jesus loves you in spite of their shortcomings or your differences. And so you see, in the Lord's Supper, it's a communion. It's not just me and God, but it's us and God as well. Uh, the word translated in our English Bibles as communion, it also means fellowship or sharing or having things in common. And so it's the idea that in the Lord's Supper, we celebrate not only our relationship with God, but we celebrate our relationship with one another. It's a two-way communion. Two-way communion. And it flows in two different directions. It flows upwards as we commune with Christ, and it flows outward as we commune with one another. As Paul said, we though many are one bread and one body. So number one, it's a commemoration. Number two, the Lord's Supper is a communion. Number three, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation. And we're going to hurry through these last two points here. It's a proclamation. You can think of it as an announcement, a declaration. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of Jesus till he comes. You know, the mission that Jesus gave his church is to proclaim his gospel to the world, right? We call it the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if you think about it, the Lord's Supper is one way that every Christian can pro proclaim the gospel, can proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You know, it's no accident that God commands that we participate in the supper, not on Friday, the day that Jesus died, but on Sunday, the first day of the week, when he rose from the dead. And listen, folks, the, the Lord's Supper is a powerful sermon, not only of the cross, but also a celebration of his resurrection, right? Right? It's a sermon that every Christian can preach every Sunday whenever we come together to break bread. And so it's a commemoration, it's a communion, it's a proclamation, and finally, the Lord's Supper carries with it a feeling of anticipation. It's an anticipation. The Supper not only is a look back, but it's also a look ahead, right? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26, that we're to observe this supper until he comes. And so we anticipate his coming. Philippians 3, 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so every time we gather around the table to partake of the bread and the wine, the elements of the Lord's Supper, not only are our minds drawn back to Calvary, but our minds are also filled with hope and anticipation of his coming return. And so in conclusion, I want you to, the next time that you assemble with your church family and you partake of the Lord's Supper, I want you to remember these things. That it's a commemoration, a communion, a proclamation, an anticipation. Since the supper is a commemoration, a memorial, then let me ask you, have you been mindful of Jesus? Have you been thinking of him? Did the, did the Savior cross your mind yesterday? And will you think about him tomorrow? And then also, since it's a communion, not only between you and God, but also between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ, is there any conflict out there between you and another brother or sister in the body of Christ that needs to be handled it so harmony can can be part of the body unity and so remember that communion not only with god but with one another and then since it's a proclamation of the gospel the death burial, and resurrection of jesus let me ask you have you obeyed that gospel have you come to believe in his death for your sins and his resurrection have you repented of your sins and been baptized into christ are you one of his children and then finally, since it's an anticipation of his return, 
Is his return something that you're looking forward to? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Or is it something you dread because you know that everything's not right between you and God? And so there's a lot to think about whenever we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And I hope these things have helped you in your understanding of the meaning and purpose behind the Supper. Let's pray. Our dearest Father in heaven, we come to you now and we thank you so much for this, this communion, this supper that your son has instituted for his church to observe on the first day of the week. Father, it's so rich with meaning. Help us to always, always partake in a way that is pleasing in, in, in your sight, looking back to Calvary and looking ahead for your precious son's return. Father, please forgive us of the times that we failed you. And we thank you so much for Jesus that makes that forgiveness and salvation possible. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.